frankly, it leaves me wondering whether the first words you learned to say were mommy or telescope. <laughs> he, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear it matter? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, he is, uh, is on the board uh, as publications director for uh, the Warren Astronomical Society. He's also a solar system ambassador for NASA. Uh, he's particularly interested in Asteroids. I've heard him give a killer asteroid presentation. Uh, and he also has a special interest in observing the sun. Um, his presentation tonight is very timely. Uh, since uh, the, the so-called NASA Dawn mission has uh, just recently arrived at, at a minor planet called Ceres. And that's his topic for tonight. Thank you. Okay, as I said, I'm uh, Bob Trumbly. I've been an amateur astronomer since uh, since uh, since before the moon landings. I'm a board member of the Warren Astro. Um, I uh, created the WASP. And uh, I also uh, do a blog for the Vatican Observatory Foundation, which uh, Brother Guy had me for him. So I, uh, I said I'm fascinated by asteroids. <coughs> And uh, before I start talking about Sirius, let, let's talk about how the solar system has changed over time. This was uh, where the solar system was since time memorial, uh, before, uh, before, before Copernicus happened. It says, here, here in the uh, geocentric, uh, well, no, 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 Copernicus, he came up with this idea that the sun is the center of uh, the solar system. And, and I, I, love, I love these here. There's no one center of all the celestial spheres. Spheres. The center of the Earth is not the center of the universe, but only a gravity, or that in the lunar sphere. All spheres revolve around the sun as their midpoint, and therefore the sun is the center of the universe. Okay, it'd be right. But in 1781, uh, Uranus was discovered, and so we have a new planet, and so all the maps of the solar system had to change at that time. And in 1801, uh, a new planet, Ceres, was discovered right between Mars and Jupiter. It was considered a planet. It was observed uh, for 41 days uh, by uh, Giuseppe Piazzi before, it, uh, before he fell ill and it, it was uh, lost to the hill of the sun. Uh, Ceres is named after the Roman goddess of agriculture, grain, crops, and fertility. Um, <coughs> this is Ceres' orbit. It sits comfortably uh, right in the middle of the asteroid belt. And this, uh, this data is from the NASA um, uh, <coughs> Minor planet object barometer. You can see Ceres has a, a slight inclination there, and uh, so that's that Ceres orbit. So between 1802 and 1807, three more <coughs> planets were discovered between Mars and Jupiter. And uh, the maps of the solar system had to change again. I loved finding these old maps when I was doing this. These are great. I want some pictures of my wall. So, uh, this is pretty much the way the solar system stayed for 40 years until in 1847 another something was discovered <coughs> between Mars and Jupiter. And about this time, people started probably going, well, that's too many. And uh, 1846, Neptune was discovered, so we have another real planet. 1847, three more planets were discovered there uh, between Mars and Jupiter. And so about around 1847 ish, uh, astronomers reclassified uh, four of those uh, planets as asteroids, leaving the other four there. Well, okay, math had to change again. In between that time and 1851, seven more planets were discovered between Mars and Jupiter. So at, at 1851, we had 19 planets. I would hate to have been a kid trying to remember all those. <laughs> So here's a, uh, uh, once again, mm -hmm, yeah, the math happens. <coughs> so in 1851, uh, the founders put their hands up in the air. They renamed all those bodies between Mars and Jupiter uh, as asteroids. And uh, that's what we have today. 1930, uh, the first Kuiper Belt object was uh, discovered, a trans Newtonian object. And at this time, we had 1,100 asteroids now. So this is 
series through a telescope, and through a telescope it's only going to appear star-like. And uh, until the Hubble Space Telescope imaged it. And one, one of the things you notice immediately through the Hubble Space Telescope is that Ceres is almost completely round. By the way, it's Hubble's 25th anniversary, so that. So in 2006, Ceres, Pluto, <coughs> and a couple other things were reclassified as dwarf planets and used the definition of a planet. And this is rather important, and it might be changing too after we fly by Pluto. Who knows? So a planet has to be in orbit around the sun, has to be round under its own gravity, and it has to have cleared its neighborhood around its orbit. Well, for Pluto, that's a problem. Pluto has not cleared its orbit. But if the Earth was where Pluto is, it wouldn't do it either. And if Pluto was where Earth was, it would be an absolutely spectacular comet. Yeah. So, uh, so, the Dawn mission, here's the Dawn, the Dawn probe. Uh, the Dawn mission goals were to compare the two most massive bodies in the asteroid belt, which is Ceres and Vesta, in order to get insights in the condition and processes that were acting on the, the Dawn of the solar system. Get it done. So, they needed to probe. so, how do you fit a big spacecraft into a launch vehicle? Well, there's, there's the solar, solar panels, and there's, there's a guy. You can see how big that sucker is. And uh, when they packaged it up like that for launch, and it was launched <coughs> in September of 20, 2007, and it's heading out into the asteroid belt. Its first destination was Vesta. Now, what the asteroid belt is not, all right? You may have seen Star Wars and seen the asteroid belt like that. <laughs> it's not like that. Not at all. If you're sitting on an asteroid, you're not going to see another one. So some of the instrumentation and, and equipment on the dome has got these ion thrusters, which are really, really cool. These things accelerate xenon to incredibly high velocities and uh, spit it out the back of these things. But it's very low thrust. It's as much thrust as a, the weight of a piece of paper over your hand. So that's very small. But it can do it for years, and it has. Uh, it originally had 137 <coughs> pounds of xenon propellant on board, and uh, it can go from zero to 60 in four days <laughs> in space. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, this ion drive was first tested in Deep Space One, which uh, uh, actually, well, some, I knew one of the guys on the mission control of that in the 80s, and uh, I wasn't paying attention to the mailing list that was posting all the stuff on Deep Space One about. So there's the ion thruster. It's very, very cool. And when I was doing research for this, I found out that Michigan Tech, which is where I graduated from, is uh, now doing research on ion space propulsion, just like they weren't when I was up there. Oh, well, it's nice to have that. And we had, a, we had a fellow, J.P. Sheehan, come and talk just recently here. And he talked about a new propulsion system being worked on, on CubeSat. So this is similar but different for the ion. So, uh, Dawn left Earth and it had a Mars gravity assist. It uh, flew by Mars and uh, used its uh, cameras to image Mars, zoom over it, and then flung it out into the asteroid belt. So, for your camera and telescope freaks, there's its instrumentation in that. Correct me if I'm wrong, that's pretty much the telescope. That's, it, that's its main framing camera right there. So, after Mars, uh, Dawn was on its way to Vesta. And there's the Vesta approach. I'm going to go over this a little bit right now. I'll cover Vesta later. So uh, as, as it approached, you know, the resolution got better and better. It has been happening with Ceres. Um, on the way to Vesta, uh, the probe had an issue with these reaction wheels. So these are, these are uh, they're, they're almost like gyroscopes, but they're spinning very, very fast. And you can change uh, the attitude of the spacecraft by changing, you know, changing the electrical current going to these things. Well, one of these things messed up on the way there, and uh, they, they powered it down, and they kept three going. They, they meant it always to run with, uh, always use three. Well, they're, they're at three now, so they're, they're kind of they're kind of sweating it there. But um, all the wheels were turned off, um, and they cruised on. And NASA uploaded new software, and they've done that again, as, and they're going to be doing that again tomorrow, as a matter of fact. But anyway, so... Um, Vesta 
departure, it was uh, delayed another week to a reaction wheel. So uh, it kept on going on and Dawn broke free of Vesta's gravity in September of 2012. Continuing on as the way the series. So uh, they modified Dawn's operating profile so it wouldn't have to use these at all. They came up with a hydrogen propellant uh, conservation scheme and uh, they're, they're using essentially RCS thrusters only to, uh, to, to angle this thing now. They're not, they're not depending on these reaction wheels at all. <coughs> it's interesting to note that the James Webb Space Telescope has six reaction wheels. They said newer technology. So two years of cruising from uh, Dawn to uh, Sierra, I'm sorry, Vesta to Ceres. Uh, on the way there, last year, the Crucial Space Observatory detected water vapor coming out of Ceres, which is very important. Now, I actually haven't heard anything about uh, Dawn detecting that yet, but uh, September of last year, uh, Dawn got nuked by a cosmic ray and shut it down for a couple days. And because of this, they lost a couple of valuable days of acceleration from the ion drive, and they had to change the approach trajectory. This is crazy. The original approach was on the bottom here, and it was pretty much like you'd expect. Of it. The new approach does this weird turn and stuff. And a video of that a little later. So in December of last year, we had an uh, impressive nine-pixel image of, uh, of Ceres here. And in January, these images keep, just keep getting better and better in January 25. But this time, this was the sharpest ever image of the dwarf planet uh, taken, surpassing images uh, taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. February 4, we start to see some surface features, which are, which are pretty interesting. February 12, again, we're starting to see cratering and some more surface features. Now, look at these guys. Yeah. Yay. So, what these, what these probably are, are impact craters that have cleared away um, some of the, the dusty dark material. And it's important to realize that uh, the series is really dark. Here we see the uh, mysterious bright spots showing up in, in February. These had a whole bunch of people wondering what they were. I actually saw one video of a guy convinced it was an alien base. <laughs> okay. I don't know how you can figure out it's an alien base with two bright spots, but okay. Right this is pretty interesting, and when, on the same on the same page when you use there, you zoom in at one end, and they see this kind of lumpy thing, and they don't know whether that's some mountain or a volcano yet. More on that later. Now, again, Sirius Albedo, it, it's darker than your moon, so when you see the bright spots, you've got to consider that it's really overexposed. So those those spots are, are probably ice. It's, it's, it's again, it's probably an impact, but uh, again, you don't know yet. So on uh, March, the, uh, um, the Dawn probe was starting to go behind the planet. We were getting um, images of crescents like this. And for, <coughs> it took a false color image. This is uh, a series surface. Uh, it, it's false color. They, they, they took the higher end blues and made them red, and they took infrared and made them blue. So this is not what it looks like. They're just doing this to do to, to no surface features. But this crater right here is really interesting. And there's, there's your bright spots right there. There, there's the, there's the approach. Um, Okay, so there's the approach. It took a whole bunch of the op navs, uh, uh, optical navigation, the uh, course corrections as they go. I imagine they would have had to have done a lot of those. So for about a month, when the Dawn uh, probe was behind Ceres, uh, there was no pictures coming, nothing at all, and I was going crazy. And I wrote this article on the Vatican Observatory blog, where are all the new images? Well, I found out there's a video they have of where all these new images are. So this is, uh, this is coming back around uh, over the top of it. <coughs> What's the rotation period? It's nine hours. Well, that's an artist's rendition of it coming back around the top. That's almost 
directly over the North Pole. I really wonder if there's any of those uh, you know, dark sh sh craters that haven't seen uh, light in forever, like on the moon. So here's the science orbits. Uh, right now, we are coming in on the second survey orbit here. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll achieve that tomorrow, as a matter of fact. That first full characterization, that's where it came in in the middle of last month. Radioactives could have caused melting. 
But Ceres is very similar to the icy moons of, of the outer planets, and which is a little weird because it's unlike anything else in the asteroid belt. <coughs> so there you can see Ceres' size uh, compared with Pluto and the moon. So it's uh, about the biggest California. So it's pretty big. It is one third of the total mass of everything in the asteroid belt. So it's really large. The <coughs> temperature is pretty warm. It was measured as negative 36 degrees, which may sound cold, but hey, Minnesota was like that two years ago. And it may have a weak atmosphere, which would be probably like a surface boundary exosphere, like our moon. It was once defined as a planet, and when it got changed, nobody freaked out about it. <laughs> I wonder, I've actually asked people, I, 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 I tried to find out, was there any public outcry about all these planets being, you know, renamed as asteroids, but I don't even think the public knew about it. And I have to wonder, if there wasn't a yellow cartoon dog named Pluto, would people have even known? Probably not. Uh, probably not. So if it has a subsurface ocean, what else could it have? If there's water, that seems to be the main ingredient for life. So I'm hoping they stay fine jets, and I'm hoping this uh, gives them the impetus to go back with something like they're planning on going to Europa, because it's closer. <coughs> so getting back to Vesta, here's the Vesta approach. And uh, a very orbital insertion, um, the radio dish was pointed away from Earth, so not that we will know it's there until it gets into orbit and aims back and tells us. So like uh, Ceres, uh, when Dawn orbited Vesta, it had uh, several different orbits getting closer and closer. And there's Vesta. And there's some pretty interesting features on it. The uh, Rhea Silvia mods and this impact mountain in the bottom of it, which is quite amazing for us. It's got these equatorial ridges, which were probably caused when, uh, when whatever hit the bottom of that. Well, there's, a, there's a computer generation of what the equatorial troughs look like above the surface. So uh, some, some interesting features. We've got ray craters. We've got craters with the uh, rims falling down. We've got, this is pretty interesting. This is probably, uh, uh, after the impact, uh, some hydrated materials uh, were released and these things sublimated or maybe explosively sublimated to cause these pits in the bottom of these craters. Some more craters here we see straight gullies. And uh, these are pretty interesting. Type B gullies, uh, sinuous gullies. Uh, an exciting and unexpected find we're still trying to understand. Longer, narrow, curvier, and short, wide, straight gullies, they tend to start from a V-shaped collapsed region described as alcoves and merge with other gullies. So we're seeing this is almost like terrestrial uh, things we're seeing out here. And I asked, uh, I asked if they'd seen it, but this is, they've seen secondary cratering. These little lines here leads right back to another crater, and that would have been ejected from a crater and smacked back down at a different location. We have evidence of some landslides. And here's some uh, uh, false colored things revealing uh, lava flow inside and outside of a crater. And uh, this one reveals material likely carried by an impact, black stuff, as well as material that was probably created by melting the red stuff. And here is a near true color window of the snowman. The thing is, yeah, it's really big. <coughs> so from Vesta, from 140 miles up, it flows kind of interesting there. So there, this is Vesta's south pole. And from this angle, Vesta almost looks round. It probably actually was. And uh, the south pole basin was actually two very large impacts. <laughs> and, uh, it is, yeah, 90% the diameter of Vesta, so it's, it's pretty darn huge. And there's a, a rendition of what <coughs> impact crater, or, you know, the impact mountain looks like compared with, from the surface and compared to other mountains. And uh, see, it's much larger than what we have in Hawaii, and uh, well, this mine's are bigger on Mars, but not much, it's, it's pretty darn big. So this is probably what happened. Uh, this, this thing got smacked really, really hard, and uh, well, it's estimated about a percent, one percent of Vesta's volume was extracted, and six percent 
of all meteorites found on the Earth come from this single impact on a vessel? How many? Six percent. That's, wow. the, that's the estimate. This is, this is the origin of the HEB meteorites, too. That's a specific type. So there's Vesta in false color, just to show you some uh, different, different uh, minerals and height values and stuff like that. So it's a very diverse body. So if they found uh, some mineral diversity at the South Pole, um, I'm not going to get too much into this. They've got mixtures of diagonal and eucharite uh, materials all over, suggest complex cross dominated. Um, by yada, yada, yada. But essentially, what they what they figure is that the patterns suggest that Vesta likely melted all the way through early in its evolution, and this looks pretty much correct. Well, this is what they're saying. It probably was like it's got a large iron core on mantle and a crust, just like the Earth. So, is it a protoplanet? Well, the mission specialists are saying it was heading down the planet forming path, and it once had a molten core. It has some characteristics of the Earth. And uh, uh, this southern, the southern uh, impact crater is about one to two billion years old. The Gekwetroth trough consistent with miles of a, of a fracture formation due to a body with a metal core. <coughs> So the, the mission specialists were calling it the smallest terrestrial planet. But our other guy and some other people came out with a paper uh, last year in December. He actually sent me this about a month before uh, it was released. And I'm like, oh my god, this is huge. Can I say anything? He's like, nope. So, but this is what he was saying is that Vesta is not a remnant protoplanet, but it's uh, a reaccreted body, which means it got smacked really hard, it broke apart, and it came back together, and it may not be differentiated. Now, the scientists, <coughs> mission specialists from uh, the, the Dawn mission, didn't like that very much. An article I read about it said they really wish he wouldn't have said that, but it's the cats out of the bag, and they have to investigate it now. So. Uh, controversy or something. Investigation still goes on on, on what, whether Vesta was a total planet or not. So the Dawn first, the Dawn mission was the first spacecraft to orbit uh, two bodies in the solar system, um, which is pretty interesting. It, it, it orbited one and left and, and it, it is in orbit around another. And this is really interesting. It has propulsively changed its velocity more than any other spacecraft, and it's still doing it. Its ion thrusters have been operating for years. So it's uh okay. I got to, I got to update that because that's not right. Sorry. Uh, Dawn, the mission is slated to end later on next year. Uh, yeah, because it's, it's 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 the the low the low the low altitude orbit doesn't happen until December eighth. So uh, when when the mission is done, they're going to be putting it into what's called a quarantine orbit. Uh, around series to keep it there for about 50 years. Now, <laughs> this so this will allow time for action in case some kind of life is detected. So they are looking for signs of life on Vesta. Hmm. They are, uh, they're running a, a, a program right now called Imagine Series, where they're inviting the public to uh, draw pictures and send them in. And I haven't updated them lately. The picture on the left there, my wife drew. And she submitted it, and they haven't posted it yet, so. Oh, well, I don't know what's going on with that. But, um, shoot. All right, let's go back just a little few minutes here. I'm going to skip some slides. So, how do you build a solar system? Where do these things come from? Well, we have a lot of star forming nebula out there. And uh, these things condense and start uh, rotating uh, around the center, and eventually a star will form in the center. And uh, these, are, these are called protoplanetary disks, and here's some examples of them from the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, these protoplanetary disks, the, the material in them, is, uh, it has a lot of stuff in it, dust and gas. Well, mostly hydrogen, a lot of helium, but the dust uh, it is a list as long as my arm of some very interesting uh, materials. Now these things, they can be uh, molecules that have anywhere from 2 to 17 atoms, and there's 
hundreds of these things. So these things start condensing and forming plants. Now these things, uh, well, they undergo thermal melting, but they get very large. They'll, they'll differentiate, which means the heavier stuff's going to sink into the center, the lighter stuff's going to float up to the top and make a crust. And that's how all the bodies in the asteroid form. Further out, uh, the volatiles don't get vaporized, and here is where you have the comets. <coughs> so, yeah, uh, now, Ceres is pretty weird, all right? It's, it's unlike anything in the asteroid belt. It's a lot like a Kuiper belt object. And one hypothesis is that it is a Kuiper belt object, or was a Kuiper belt object. The Nice model here uh, it hypothesizes that Jupiter and Saturn originally started closer in through some process I do not understand, uh, migrated out and flung all this stuff around, and Ceres was one of them, and it flung Ceres into where the asteroid is now. So that, that, that's it, Ceres, Ceres that, that's the hypothesis. It was originally an accreted trans-Neptunian object, and it moved into the asteroid belt. So there's the differentiation process, so some definitions, yeah, I know. Asteroid, these are, are, are these are anywhere from uh, one, one meter to several hundred kilometers. Uh, some of them are dwarf planets. The, the, the whole definition is kind of crazy. Um, they have been called protoplanets before. The dwarf planets, so these are what Ceres and Pluto are now. These are planetary mass objects that are not planets or satellites. They have not cleared the region. And uh, here's the total definition, if you want to mm -hmm. bend your mind and take a look at that. It's so like, that's crazy, and I'm sure that's going to change after a uh, new horizon goes, uh, goes past Pluto. Yeah, that's kind of crazy. So we have a lot of definitions, and this is, again, this has changed over time a lot. Well, that is pretty much the end of my presentation. I can ask a quick what June 30th, Asteroid Day, uh, this is a uh, Bob's the Asteroids. This is a, a global awareness campaign uh, started over in England, and uh, they're going to be doing this every single year to raise awareness about asteroid impacts and deflection campaigns and that kind of thing. Uh, Cranbrook, I'm, I'm, I'm actually doing something with Cranbrook not on June 30th, on July 11th here. We're going to be doing a whole thing on asteroids. It's going to be very cool. The horizons, kind of in the new New Horizons fly by Pluto this summer. Juno flies by, or Juno orbits Jupiter in July. And they don't have Rosetta on here, but Rosetta is orbiting uh, <coughs> the uh, comet <coughs> Chernobyl Jirishimenko. Did I get that right? P67 is good. Thank you. <laughs> but anyway, that, that's it for uh, my series. We don't, I don't have any science data yet. We're still, we're still zeroing in. The, uh, so it's going to go into a high-level mapping orbit in July, and it's going to go into a low-level mapping orbit uh, in December, and we're going to start getting some uh, real science data then. <coughs> I'll, I'll, keep, I'll keep everybody posted as to what we get. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Yeah. No.
we have we have we have ways of doing things now that they didn't have back then. Committees. <coughs> well, yeah, that's it. Like the IA. Or I have a question for you. I noticed on one of your slides you said that this was the first uh, uh, mission that flew by two uh, to orbit. Orbit. Well, what about mission. the Voyager program? It didn't orbit. It did not orbit. orbit. Fly by. They were all flybys. Right. I didn't they're still ahead now. Yeah, I know they're going now, but I didn't know that they had been orbiting for a short while. Okay. Any other? Yes, Jeff. What's the surface gravity like? Like how low is the surface gravity? Would it, be like, <laughs> would it be like really difficult to do a, a landing mission no. where you have to no, use the surface gravity? No, the surface gravity is probably not very much. Oh yeah, they just don't come down. Yeah. Okay, so really, yes, yeah. they would come down. They would take yeah. off quite a week. Yeah. Well, if the moon is one sixth, okay, you're supposed yeah. to do that. I, I, I would guess that the surface well, gravity on well, Ceres is 15. a few well, percent of the gravity. surface gravity on the Earth, maybe five percent or so. Yeah. Uh, give or take a factor of two. <laughs> okay. That's scary. Uh, other questions? I mean, the double, the, the comet P67, it looks like two, uh, two chunks stuck together. I actually calculated for that a rough estimate based on the size and the density and stuff. That you could reach escape velocity from that by a really fast <laughs> jump. <laughs> it wouldn't come back down. But if you notice the lobes, there are points where they overlap, so you could probably jump from one and land or run your head into the point that's above you. <laughs> which is why, which is why the European craft that tried to land, you know, they came in just a little too fast and it bounced like a kilometer high, and then another bounce, and why they, you know, didn't wind up where they wanted it. Uh, other questions. I have been playing a game recently called Kerbal Space Program, and I'm going to have something on the loss about it, but uh, it is a simulation of the space program, and somebody replicated the Dawn mission in the game and has made a video of, they've interspliced images of Dawn and from the game. It is just amazing, and uh, I'll be talking more about the game a lot later. Ken uh, found it, it's 3% uh, of the surface gravity here on Earth. Actually, 0.29. <laughs> um, okay, uh, let's uh, thank yeah. our speaker. Thank you. Thank you. For those uh, who are so inclined, uh, some of us uh, go to a restaurant after this. Uh, it's called the Redcoat Tavern. It's on uh, Woodward Avenue, just a little north of 13 Mile Road, on the east side of the road, uh, for some refreshments and conversation. So, all are welcome.